Good morning to all of my father's children. We greet you in the name of Jesus the Christ and welcome you again on this morning to another opportunity to share the word of God with the people of God. But before we go into the word on today, I wanted us to take just a moment to reflect about a year ago. For it was about this time last year that we began to hear more and more rumblings of the word coronavirus. And as we heard of this virus, we had no idea of the impact it would have in our world or in our society. But here we are one year later and we're still separated one from the other. We're still unable to come together as the family of God in fellowship in our household of faith. We're still under various types of restrictions. And we're also hearing the numbers of those infected by the virus and those who have lost their lives because of the virus continuing to grow. Unlike the normal flu that we experience each and every season, this particular virus is totally different. And so as we have now endured its effects for a year now, it's very easy for us to become complacent because we're COVID tired, began to let down our guard and relax our position. And my brothers and sisters, I want to caution all of you, young and old, about this. We are grateful today that we're able to say that in this year's time, we have lost no lives in our fellowship because of the virus. But yet still, brothers and sisters, the virus is not gone. It's still around. And so we must still be watchful and careful. Now we have multiple types of, I guess they would call it the uh, vaccinations that are being produced. And there's a stigma that is out uh, saying that African Americans are less reluctant at taking the vaccination. And I can't command, I can't demand but I can ask you to consult your family physician. It is through the medical personnel who are able to give us the proper information as to whether we should proceed in taking the vaccination or if it would cause some harm to an already existing condition. We heard just this week that there were people who are coming from Montgomery County over into Prince George's County to be vaccinated. My brothers and sisters, as they say, what God has for you is for you. Also, what is deemed for the residents of Prince George's County ought to be used for the residents of Prince George's County. We know that more of the vaccination is going to filter in and Eventually, everyone will have an opportunity to receive it. But I certainly want to encourage our elderly and those of who are in a uh, first response uh, position. I want you to consider uh, talking with your physician as to whether you would take the vaccination or not. I'm looking forward to time and the opportunity it is offered to those in my age group that we might be able to uh, take the vaccination and hopefully be able to ward off this deadly virus. 
But my brothers and sisters, I'm still looking forward to us coming together back in the household of faith. And it is my prayer that when we experience that day of Jubilee, that we would have lost no lives due to the COVID-19 virus. So I encourage you, continue to take care of yourself, wear your mask, maintain your social distancing, be careful, and let us prepare to join in fellowship again. I thank you for this moment and I'm praying for each and every one of you. So now that we have said that, this is a joyful day that our Heavenly Father has once again tapped our shoulders, called our name, and woke us up early on this morning. And for the first time, let us do something just a little bit different. Where we are in our various homes or wherever we may be listening to or viewing this particular broadcast, let us start this day by saying, Good morning, Father. We wake up and we say good morning to all those who are around us, but let us remember our God who watched over us as we slept and slumbered last night and woke us up with the finger of love on this morning. We greet him in the glorious and majestic spirit and presence that is due him. Good morning, Father. We pray that the Lord certainly has continued to bless your life. And as always, we thank you for allowing us to come and to take some time out of your daily activity on this Sunday morning to share with you a word from the Lord. On this morning, our scripture will be found in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. And we're going to be reading in your hearing verses 19 and 20. First Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. And reading from the New International Version of Scripture, we will find these words. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. And are you not your own? For we were brought, bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let us pray. To the most high and awesome creator, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment, and we thank you, O oh God, for our presence in it. We ask so today, Lord, that you would again speak into our hearts, speak into our minds, speak into our spirits, that we might hear your instructions and yield to that which you have called us to do. Lord, we honor you and we glorify you. And as always, we are privileged to be your children. So now, Lord, teach us that we might bring you glory. This we do ask and pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our souls say, Amen. 
Amen, amen, and amen. Today I want to share with you from the subject, church trappings. Church trappings. Have you noticed how much competition there is among churches today? Churches are using every idea imaginable to attract and keep members. One church might strive to offer the best musical ensemble. And so they hire great musicians who promise to take the music ministry to the next level with renditions of the latest worship songs that we so frequently hear on the airwaves. And as they succeed in that genre of music, they abandon the traditional songs of Zion. Some churches take a different approach at growth. They spend time developing creative programs that attract worshipers, offering free babysitting services on Saturdays so parents can have some us time. They sponsor classes like Zumba for the young and day outings for the seniors fishing trips for the men and shopping trips for the women. So the church becomes an admired clubhouse of fun and fellowship. And those things are great as long as it's offered as a benefit to those who worship and study together to grow in church. Remember that old American express slogan of years ago, membership should have its privileges. But still some other churches offer giveaways as a means of attracting new members. They, they give flowers on Mother's Day, free breakfast on Father's Day, and many more free meals throughout the year. They give away food and clothing all year long, toys at Christmas time, turkeys at Thanksgiving. And those churches usually watch their congregations swell as the freebie days approach and then shrink again when the free stuff runs out. Many churches are guilty of trying all of these ideas once in a while, as though these attractions are the secret to a growing congregation. If it works, great but it usually doesn't. And the churches end up relying on a select few to do all the work to grow the body of Christ. And I call these administrative offerings church trappings. For they are designed to attract and hook new worshipers of course, with the hope of keeping them. But how many of you know that it takes more than church trappings to make a good disciple? A good disciple is one who worships the Lord regardless of all the frills of the church. It doesn't matter to them which choir is singing. 
they're going to worship the Lord. It doesn't matter which preacher is preaching. They're there to worship the Lord. And it doesn't matter if it's a fifth Sunday, for they are still going to worship the Lord. Stop and think about it. What would you do if all the trappings of church were removed? No organ, no padded pews, no stained glass windows, no giveaways, no purely social get-togethers. Just plain old-fashioned prayer and praise where you have to utter all the prayer and submit unto God all the praise. What if the air conditioner went out in summer? Or what if the heat went out in winter? You do know there were days and times when the church did not have these things, yet they continued to be and to assemble as the church. What if the government outlawed our faith and we had to go underground like the early Christians and worship in a cave? How long would it take before the generation completely abandons the house of God and worse still, the God of the house if all the frills of the church were gone. I've said it before, that people have the tendency to shop churches like they shop grocery stores. But pretend with me for a moment that the government has banned all worship, removed all Bibles, forbidden the mentioning of the Lord God or his son, Jesus Christ. What would you do? Would you throw up your hands and say like the Jews in Babylon, how can we sing the Lord's songs, the songs of Zion in a strange land? Would you quit worshiping God? I remember the movie, The Book of Eli, with Denzel Washington. That particular movie portrayed what it would be like to preserve our faith in an oppositional environment. For in order for Eli to hide the Bible, he had to memorize it in its entirety. And it's the only way that he could safely transport it many miles to modern day monks who were trying to restore the printed word. And God would be in serious trouble if he had to depend on us to preserve his word in that type of situation. Some of us have trouble remembering the Lord's Prayer or reciting the 23rd Psalm. Can you boast that you are preserving any part of the word of God for future generations. What has preserved the word of God for these past 2,000 years? And what will preserve it for the millenniums that are to come? And that, my brothers and sisters, the answer is found in our text. First, Paul writes to the church at Corinth 
And he says to them, know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And to put that another way, it says that God's word is preserved in us. This is a fleshly container. And it's all we have to store the word of God. We are the looking glass through which the world sees our Savior. And this storage container matters. And you've got to keep your temple in good shape. Once you put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, you must understand that it takes continuous maintenance to keep your temple in good repair. I don't know about anybody else, but for me, there's no greater eyesore than a deteriorating temple. For us, that usually starts with feeling too grown for Sunday school or too busy for Bible study. For those are the first signs of poor temple maintenance. And before you know it, those feet that were once shod with the preparation of the gospel don't feel like such a good foundation to stand on anymore. And once the foundation weakens, the breastplate of righteousness starts to show signs of tarnish. First, it's just skipping the fifth Sunday then maybe you shrink your attendance down to two or three Sundays a month. And after that, it's only a matter of time before your helmet of salvation, your spiritual roof, springs to a leak. So brothers and sisters, hear me today. God's word is preserved in you. You are the carrier of his plan of salvation. An unbeliever should be able to find in you God's solution for all of earth's problems because you are the mirrored image of a living Christ. Godly in character, humble in spirit, pure in motive and loving in attitude, faithful in your commitment, careful in your conduct, compassionate in your heart. And so I say unto you today, keep your temple polished and in good shape. The second thing that Paul tells the Corinthian church and says to us today is to know that you are bought with a price. Those are, are the most spoken words of the Bible. For ye are bought with a price. And if those words are so important, then we need to know just what it means. Jesus Christ went to Calvary for a good reason. And these temples of ours were nothing more than corrupted carcasses. And we needed someone to wash away our sins. We needed someone to lift us 
from the gutters of life. We needed someone to redeem our eternal soul, someone to cleanse us from all corruption and free us from bondage and therefore make us whole again. And the cost for our redemption was a death sentence. And brothers and brothers in Christ, sisters in our Father, Jesus Christ paid the price. Consider the fact that Satan kicked us down. But Jesus lifted us up. Satan bound us in sin. But Jesus released us. Satan destroyed us. But Jesus redeemed us. Satan had ruined us. But Jesus gave us a fresh Satan gave us sorrow, but Jesus brought us joy. He paid the price for our salvation. His sacrifice on the cross accomplished what we could not do in a lifetime. Jesus paid the price to save us, forgive us, redeem us, cleanse us, and finally to bless us. And today we're able to say no longer are we burdened by our blunders. No longer are we discouraged by our defeats. No longer are we hindered by our hardships. And no longer are we attacked by our adversaries. No longer are we plagued by our perils and no longer are we forsaken by a world full of sin. Our Savior Jesus Christ's precious blood sacrifice on Calvary's cross paid the price for our rescue. So there are three things that you need to know from our text about maintaining your temple. First is to know that the body is the temple of God. The second is to know that you were brought with a price. And the third thing that you must know is know that you must glorify God in both body and spirit. And you must understand that's not an option. We owe a sufficient response to our Lord for his loving kindness his tender mercies, and his all-sufficient grace, his abundant blessings, and his generous benefits. And what is that response? What do we owe the Lord for his expressions of loving kindness extended toward us? Paul says that we must glorify God in both body and and spirit. Your temple's purpose is to glorify God. What else would you use the temple for? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, to let our light so shine before men that they might see our good works and glorify our Father which in heaven. And that was not a mere suggestion, but that was a command. So 
Brothers and sisters, give unto the Lord today, tomorrow, the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. <coughs> Praise the bread that satisfies our soul's hunger. Praise the fountain that quenches our spirit's thirst. Praise the light that illuminates our path. Praise the compass that directs our course. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. For he has opened the windows of heaven. Praise God. For he has transcended the powers of evil. And redeemed our soul from sin. Praise God. For Christ has regarded our helpless estate. And has shed his own blood for our soul. Praise God and give him the glory that is due his name. For replacing our gloom with his glory. Praise him for reviving our weakness with his strength. Praise him for replacing our burdens with blessings. Praise him for rekindling our flickering frame with his unfailing love. If you are caught up today in church trappings, let it be these trappings that have truly trapped you. Let it be the love of God that lives within you. Let it be the blood of Christ that was shed to save you. Let it be the power of the Spirit that was sent down from heaven to embolden you. Be trapped by these things and let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Giveaways and great days are welcome in our society. But even if you never gave me anything, when God gave his only begotten son, that is the best gift that I could ever receive. And I know, my brothers and sisters, that there are times when ministries attract and activities bring joy. But I want you to know today that the joy of the Lord is still my strength. There are times when the church is blessed to be able to help the needy and the poor, fulfilling what is instructed in the gospel by Matthew 25. But my brothers and sisters, I remember the opening words of the 23rd Psalm. And it says that the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. And that says unto me today that whatever I stand in need of, I don't have to look for a gadget or a gimmick. I don't have to look for a program or a process. Because God has already fixed it up. That whatever I stand in need of today, he will provide. And just because I know that, 
I give him all the glory, the honor, and the praise. But I've said so many times that it seems like it's rhetoric, but I truly believe it in the depths of my heart. If the Lord never blesses me with anything else, He's already blessed me with enough. And I'll praise him for the final and the rest of the days of my life. For all the things that he has done, what he is doing, and what is to come. To God be the glory for what he has brought and given to his children. Don't get hung up on church trappings, but give God the praise every day and you will find that he will supply all of our needs. Let us pray. Eternal God in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you have done and what you continue to do in our lives. We thank you for the blessings that have already flowed our way. We thank you, O oh great Father, for those that have not been received but yet have been designed and designated specifically for us. And we trust and believe that what you have for us will truly be for us. So we thank you today, God. Also, we thank you for your watchful eye. That even as we go through this world, you continue to provide and protect us, keeping us from hurt, harm, and danger. And ever so often, oh God, you stir up our soul and call us by your spirit that we might enter into worship with you. We thank you for the great opportunities that we might sing your praise. For Lord, truly you are awesome, you are great, you are wonderful, you are our everything. And now God, if there's anybody who has tuned in and stopped by today and they are looking for something special, unique, in their lives that would help them, help them along their journey. Lord, I pray that they would look to the hills from whence their help cometh and recognize as we have that our help cometh from you. Crown their life with your mercy and your grace. Bring unto them O oh Lord, the joy of your salvation. And in doing so, Lord, we know that you would take care of their life and you will bless their way. We pray today, O oh God, if we have done anything that has tarnished our breastplate of righteousness, if any way we have kicked off our boots, our feet shotted with the gospel of peace. If any way, oh God, we have forgotten you or sinned against you, we pray for your forgiveness. We ask today, oh God, that you would come and continue to crown our head with the helmet of salvation. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for your house that continues to be a symbol unto a dying world that your presence is still with us in the world. We love you and we bless your holy name. In Jesus Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Again, thank you for stopping by today. We do want to encourage you to 
Join us on Wednesday evenings from 7 to 8 <coughs> via Zoom. This past week, we finally closed out the book, The Bible is Black History. Just in case you haven't had the opportunity to acquire the book or to read a book, Amazon carries it. It's by Dr. Theron Williams. Pick up that book and read it. I guarantee you it will bless your life. You will discover some things that you had not thought of, you had not considered before. And so in that, the knowledge itself is a blessing. On this coming Wednesday from 7 to 8 at Wednesday in the Word, we're going to open up a study in the Articles of Faith. So we encourage you to join us on uh, Wednesday night as we began looking and, dis and discussing the Articles of Faith. The things that we believe our doctrine teaches us about our Lord and our selves. So we're inviting you to tune in. And then as always, each and every Thursday evening at the 6.30 hour, the prayer warriors of the Abyssinia Baptist Church come together on a conference call and they are praying for our church. They're praying for our community, praying for our country. They are praying for you. And we invite you to come and participate, be a part of that praying session. We advise you and, and encourage you to continue to pray one for the other. For regardless of what things and how things may look, we all still stand in the need of prayer. And my brothers and sisters, if God has blessed you in such a way, we invite you to uh, send your tithes to, or offerings to our ministry. You can send them by way of what we call snail mail uh, through the postal system to Abyssinia Baptist Church, 4705 Capitol Heights, Maryland, 20743. You can stop by and visit us at PayPal uh, at Abyssinia Baptist uh, recognizing it is the Capitol Heights Church, Capitol Heights, Maryland. You can also visit us on our website and give through our website, our secured website, or through the mobile app, Givelify. But we encourage you to continue to support our ministry. And we want you to know that each and every gift is prayed over and we are grateful to receive it. It helps us to continue to carry the gospel and the good news about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into the world. So until the next time that God pulls us and draws us together, as always, we say unto you, stay safe, stay tuned, and stay connected. God bless you, and may heaven smile upon you and give you peace until we meet again. Good day.